Call of Duty Infinite Warfare has to be one of the strangest Call of Duty titles to date. A game that, before its release, was universally shredded almost by the entire COD community, and is the most disliked COD trailer on YouTube ever. In fact, some of you watching this video probably participated in making that dislike bar what it is today. But the weird thing is, I, I actually have a hard time finding somebody that still holds that level of disdain for this game anymore. Even the comments on the trailer at the time show a brutal reception and an absolute hatred for COD and Infinite Warfare in particular, but more recent comments show a more gracious, nostalgic take on the game. In fact, compared to many other COD games released around the same time frame, this was one of the more poorly selling titles, not even able to surpass the sales of World at War, and falling shockingly low compared to other games. And when it comes to discussing the greats and the best of all time within the COD franchise, the community will be quick to jump on the Black Ops, Modern Warfare 2s, and so on, but very rarely, if ever, is Infinite Warfare ever considered a serious contender to be one of the GOATs. But the question is, did Infinite Warfare deserve this level of criticism? Are there areas in the game in which that dislike bar is actually justified? Was Infinite Warfare secretly a masterpiece that was never given a chance because of its poor initial reception, or was it actually just a bad video game in some instances? After recently revisiting the game and combining it with how I felt about it at the time of its release, I'm taking a more holistic approach to answering these questions. It's going to be a quite nuanced discussion today with Infinite Warfare, and it's not quite as simple as labeling the game good or bad, so let's explore the complexity of Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. As I always say in these reviews, it's crucial to consider the context of the times in which a game released. Sure, we can look back now and appreciate any game for what it was, but you have to remember, during the time it came out, this came across as so out of touch with the COD fanbase. I personally think Infinite Warfare suffered from a bad case of wrong place at the wrong time. Infinite Warfare would be the third futuristic Call of Duty game in a row when the future fatigue was certainly setting in with the fans. Infinite Warfare was also able to have a full three-year development cycle, so think about it this way. Black Ops 2 is wrapping up. Infinity Ward then released COD Ghost. Not really a futuristic game, but moderately future slash modern times or whatever. As soon as Ghost released, Infinity Ward starts production on Infinite Warfare. In the meantime, Advanced Warfare and then Black Ops 3 subsequently release, and by that point, two more years have gone by, allowing the future fatigue to set in. But but guess what? Infinity Ward still had to release their game regardless. COD fans may have considered this out of touch for them to release another futuristic game, but again, at the time of production, that was not the community sentiment that was going around at all. In fact, I have a theory that if Infinite Warfare released in the place of Advanced Warfare instead, it may still have struggled, yes, but wouldn't have had nearly as poor of a reception as it did. But it didn't really matter. In any case, I think the whole dislike bar thing and the poor reception was just angry gamers trying to send a message to Call of Duty developers and Activision that they're tired of futuristic COD stuff, which is fair enough, but it's not like they had the chance to fundamentally change direction on a project that they've been creating for three years. My point is, no matter the quality of the game itself, it had already lost in the court of public opinion. It was over before it had even released. Call of Duty and Activision even saw this coming, so they slapped on Modern Warfare Remastered as an incentive to get people to play the game because they knew otherwise nobody wanted to play this. We have a passionate group of people out there that love this series, and a lot of them have expressed their exasperation. They wanted Infinity Ward to go back to the Modern Warfare kind of uh, game design. What do you have to say to, to those people out there? Yeah, I feel like we have a really good offering this year. I mean, if you want to play Modern Warfare Remastered, that's coming out as well. And we're, we're executive producing it and working on it. So, you know, we had a team and we had a three year development cycle and we wanted to work on something that we were all super passionate about. And as I mentioned, you know, like we are all, all space nuts yep. at Infinity Ward. So we're happy to work on that game. Um, you know, if you love Modern Warfare, check out Modern Warfare Remastered. It's going to be amazing. Awesome. Well, I'm a space nut. 
I'm a space nut. Interestingly enough, I attended COD XP 2016 in Los Angeles, and I remember clear as day at the event, there were tent booths set up to play Infinite Warfare multiplayer early, and a different tent for COD 4 Remastered on the other side of the venue. And one of these tents were dry as a bone. You could literally walk in and play as soon as you enter, while the other had a line wrapped around the building to play that lasted for hours at any given point during the day. And I'm sure you can guess which one was more popular popular there. Call of Duty colon infinite wars man yo before we go any deeper into this i just want to say if you're enjoying the video and want to see more cod reviews i'm going to be doing one for every single title make sure to subscribe as a little over 80 percent of you guys aren't currently subbed to the channel and we are getting extremely close to half a million as i go throughout the journey of reviewing all these call of duty games i'm going to be playing with you guys you know community members so if you guys want to actively participate in those you can become a channel member and we'll play some multiplayer games together uh depending on the cod game i'm reviewing so if you want to take part in that and hang out you can feel free to do so otherwise Otherwise, you don't have to. Other than that, I sincerely hope you guys are enjoying the video so far. And with that said, uh, let's continue. Call of Duty colon Infinite Wars, man. Infinite Warfare is what you get when a bunch of people from the film industry get involved with video games, and I'm not implying one way or another on whether that's a good or bad thing, just objectively, that's how it was. Many film cinematographers, writers, and actors alike all played a huge part in every aspect of the game, which you'll see is made abundantly clear as we go along. Getting people like Kevin Smith, David Hasselhoff, Kit Harington, insane amounts of film references and zombies, the actors literally mo-capping for the campaign pain and so on, it's very clear people in the film industry had a huge influence on how this game was handled. Now again, whether that's a good or bad thing is entirely up to you, but it means some clear choices were made in how it handles storytelling and gameplay. Infinite Warfare's content package would see a full single player campaign, multiplayer of course, and zombies. And all these film guys had massive pulls in each of these pillars, so let's start with where it's most appropriate to begin, the single player campaign. Infinite Warfare's campaign was practically the reason people hated this game before it launched, that's all we knew about. The setting and the premise alone were enough to make people become disinterested in it already and not even play it, but was this the right judgment? Well, I think Infinite Warfare's campaign story is actually a pretty mediocre premise and plot, but that's carried by super strong characters that are all well written and extremely likable. The basic premise is that Earth is running out of precious raw materials. We have to look to space to keep Earth functioning. A faction known as the Settlement Defense Front, or SDF, is basically the barricade that prevents Earth from getting the materials it needs to sustain itself. But the motivation for the SDF to not like Earthlings is pretty shaky at best. They sum it up like there's basically a weird culture that grows when you're raised that detached from Earth. Uh, I never really bought this motivation, and it always felt a little bit flimsy to me. The reason the SDF and Earth are enemies is never really clear, and it's only kind of addressed with half answers, at, at least from what I can tell. And if there is some real substantial reason why the SDF actually hates Earth, and you know why, please keep it to yourself, because I really don't care all that much. My point is, whatever the reason is, it's not made clear to the player in-game. But as far as what they could do, like, hey, how about this instead? Maybe we see some negotiations between Earth and the SDF. Perhaps it's cordial and things are going well, but maybe there's some kind of real personal betrayal or backstabbing that happens, sending all the parties into a revenge frenzy. They kind of tried that with, like, the random guy that turned the weapons on themselves after the Europa incident. Problem is, it just wasn't set up very well. We don't really understand why these characters don't like each other so it's uh it's a little bit of a shaky premise to build off of why are we fighting and why would we fight in space i don't understand we're all on the planet earth brian why would i go fight in space i, I think you know taylor touched on it it's that you know the, the future uh we'll be fighting over just it's fine don't be afraid of it just I, who just right there and then okay. just talk into it like this okay thank you it's okay <laughs> it's creepy uh, <laughs> um very hands-on in <laughs> yes um 
even the guy that practically sets off the entire plot via his betrayal, it's never really clear why he betrayed and doesn't like Earth, other than being a psychopath or something. It's not perfect, but hypothetically, that could have at least been one explanation for why they hate Earthlings, besides no reason at all. You, co I swear to God, yeah. if you keep leaning away from that microphone. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. You. The whole plot is the UNSA trying to destroy the SDF so that Earth can get materials, and that's pretty much it. Like, you never really get to see too much how Earth is suffering as a result of this material bleed out so you kind of forget that's the whole reason you're fighting in the first place sometimes but while the premise plot and motivation sometimes are thin at worst and questionable at best i cannot deny the game has some of the best written characters ever in a call of duty campaign Brian Bloom, who is also one of the lead writers on the story, plays Daniel Reyes, the main character. He's a Navy man who finds himself in the captain's chair after the previous captain was killed off screen after the Europa incident and has to lead the charge against the SDF. Brian does great in this role and he's very believable. You're rooting for him and he's genuinely a selfless guy. Brian Bloom's personality goes very well with this character and the whole story is told from his perspective and the player sees everything through his eyes for the most part. He's joined by Nora Salter, played by Jamie Gray Hyder, and she's awesome in the role of Salter as well, who is his partner in the Navy and are practically family at this point. Their relationship as military partners and friends comes across crystal clear. They're always looking out for each other no matter what, and will even fight and argue with one another to try to bring out the best in each other. She's got a good heart, just like Reyes, and they're just such easy characters to root for. They come across as actual good friends on and off screen. The dynamic of their relationship is what drives the story forward and what makes you care. The supporting characters are all great as well. Ethan, who's a sentient AI, he's one of the few robot characters in any media that I actually felt something for in the story. Most AI characters can be very hard to care about sometimes because you know at the end of the day, they're just a bot. There's a few examples of when this can actually work well, but it's very difficult for any media to pull off to any real degree. But Ethan fills the comedic relief role in an otherwise very grim premise, and Omar, a marine who initially has beef and tension with Reyes, they butt heads a little bit during missions, and this is mostly a result of marine and navy superiority, but eventually come to understand one another better, and despite their differences, they still continue to look out for one another above all else. Each character in the campaign has a distinct personality trait, and you feel like you really get to know them fairly well as the story progresses, and the main antagonist of the campaign is played by, uh, well, me. You see, I, I look a lot like Kid Harrington, but the only difference is, I I'm just, like, way less cool. So in the first mission, I'm all like... showing that I can do whatever I want, even killing my own men, just to establish how intimidating and untouchable Admiral Salen Koch really is. Right off the bat, you establish that Jon Snow's an unmatched power force within the SDF. His ship, the Olympus Mons, is a mega starship that is feared throughout the entire space area they inhabit, with his direct goal of defeating all traces from Earth and people from it. While Admiral Salem Koch is not what I would consider to be one of the best COD villains we've seen over the years, Kit Harrington does great in the role and it looks like he's really enjoying it. In fact, you can tell how much passion everyone's putting into the performances and they all look like they're having a great time as well. Now, the gameplay structure of the campaign is a little different compared to what was standard at the time. While at its core, it's still a linear story being told, there are elements of control we previously didn't have before. As Captain Reyes, you exercise control over the pace of the game to some degree. You as the player are in control of what missions you take, how you take them, and in what order. You can also take breaks in between, you know, missions to explore your ship, the retribution, and really let the world soak in a little bit. I have to say, the set pieces and locations are pretty incredible. I know COD Ghost did space combat missions first, but I gotta say Infinite Warfare did them much better. There's more depth to the space mechanics, and it's a lot more free-flowing while still retaining the core gameplay loop. And speaking of Ghost, Infinite Warfare has some of the best dialogue between characters during and after missions I've ever seen in a COD campaign. It has tactical humanoid, third revision. It's a mouthful. You ain't kidding. Call me Ethan, ma'am. What are your orders? I'm assigned to retribution, reporting to Captain Alder. Program for combat? Thoroughly, ma'am. Born to kill. 
Look like you can kick some serious ass. Well, now you're just making me blush, sir. Compared to Ghost with some of the worst, most cringy and embarrassing dialogue ever put on paper. He called them ghosts. And this really happened. So the legend goes. Come on, Dad. You don't honestly believe that story's true. Yeah, I do. Uh, you know, uh... In Infinite Warfare, they also worked with real-life Navy and Marines to make sure that the dialogue and tactics that they used were technically sound as well. And you can tell in how the game's written, the characters speak in military jargon the majority of the time. Get Raven transport set for evac. I want our casualties outbound right away. Drop officer, coordinate with engineer and get us mobile. Roger. Engineer McCollum's on our way. And the game doesn't feel the need to oversimplify what's being conveyed. They speak very matter-of-factly, and it's not a cringy, dare I say it, Hollywood way of writing things. We have to go back. Our dad's down there, and we're not leaving without him. That's real admirable view. But your father's not there anymore. Dad, this whole time, you, you were one of them. You were a ghost. And, um... Uh... uh since you now have so much control over missions and how you approach them, inevitably there are going to be some side missions and content that aren't as strong. The side missions in Infinite Warfare are completely optional and do not affect the ultimate outcome of the game, but they do help illustrate the world and the context that the game is writing on. The gameplay quality of these side missions can definitely vary. The flight missions are actually okay usually, and there's more depth to the flight mechanics in this game compared to say something like Black Ops 2. While again, they aren't necessary, they do a good job at giving the player choice if they want to spend longer hanging out in this world, but they can get a little repetitive and ultimately, you don't need to play these at all and they won't affect the outcome. The slowdown in pace and the taking the time for the world to breathe a little bit in between missions is something I love about this campaign. It's during these moments the characters have small talk, little character moments, and interactions that make you appreciate the characters that much more. There's a little easter egg apparently, uh, in Jamie Gray Hyder was always eating snacks on set, so they worked in a small snack bar into her fighter jet just as a little character easter egg trait thing. It's clever and, and something that's fun. And there's a bunch of that stuff throughout the world if you're paying attention enough. The main missions are all very well executed though, the create a class system also returns allowing you to choose your weaponry and gear, and while this one does feel a little more weighted compared to the Black Ops 2 campaign, weaponry still doesn't mean a whole lot other than if you're primarily fighting humans or robots. Humans are more prone to ballistic weapons in this game, and robots are more weak to energy based weapons, which is a pretty neat detail, but other than that, the create a class is still kinda hollow. I give this game points for excellent world building and extremely unique set pieces. There's a mission in which you land on a small asteroid and its rotation and proximity to the sun means that you have to be in shielded areas or in the shade if you want to move, otherwise you'll burn to death in the full force of the sun. Obviously, you can nitpick the science of that, but it would be missing the point if you did. It's such a fun concept on its own, and Infinite Warfare has plenty of interesting visuals and set pieces that carry the campaign almost as hard as the characters do. When you reach the point in the campaign where you finally have to kill me, it's a satisfying moment, but the fight isn't over. To fully defeat the SDF, the station has to be destroyed, and through a series of individual sacrifices made, each character dies in service of the ultimate goal. Even Ethan and Reyes in the last mission give it all up to finish the job. Salt has to overcome wanting to protect Reyes and finish the mission, even if it costs him his life. It's actually sad seeing Reyes sacrifice himself for the mission, and I actually really like the somewhat unceremonious way he dies as well. This game earns its emotional moments. I can, I can still fight. I know you can, Marine. We're gonna get you back out there in no time. Brooks, where's that med kit? Let's go! Is that rain, sir? Instead of having very forced, contrived... Hey guys. Don't everybody rush over at once! 
and awkward attempts to connect emotionally with the player. The idea is to finish the mission no matter the cost, and Reyes and Salter even argue back and forth about this concept. It ends up costing Reyes' life in the end so that Nora could live. It's a story that even the most cynical part of me can't be too critical about. Sure, there are some flaws, character logic and motivation aren't always sound, but it's a nice story with some of the best characters to carry it the whole way through. Like I often say, I criticize COD campaigns for being glorified interactive movies, and when the story sucks and the characters suck, I hate it for that. But in this particular case, it's so well done and executed, I can't even consider that a bad thing. At the end of the day, you can feel how much effort went into the single player mode, and everyone did great in their performances, and despite some never acting in video games prior to this one, they all look like they got something great out of it and just genuinely had fun making it too. And I had a good time playing it, so I think they succeeded insofar as the single player story goes. Okay, so unfortunately, the multiplayer element is where Infinite Warfare starts to fall apart a little bit for me. This has mostly to do with the fact that it's basically a recycled and watered-down version of Black Ops 3's multiplayer. Think about it this way. Advanced Warfare said, hey, we're breaking the rules of traditional COD move-in and giving you a boost jetpack, and it was a new idea to COD at the time. Still very primitive and unrefined, however, I might add. Black Ops 3 took that concept and said, hey, we're going to refine this, do something a bit different and make it into our own style, giving you the ability to control the movement a bit better and also the ability to wall run and so on, felt like a genuine progression of what AW brought to the table. Infinite Warfare just said, copy Black Ops 3's homework, but try not to make it obvious. So it's mostly that issue, and also for some reason, a completely unnecessary amount of artificial depth in its systems, which I'll explain. So, to begin, let me start out with the things that I dislike about Infinite Warfare's multiplayer before I discuss the things that I do like. Firstly, the specialists in this game quite literally feel just copy and pasted from Black Ops 3. Virtually the same abilities, mechanics, and all. They're almost one-to-one -one recreations, but they're not bad per se, they, and they work as they should, Problem is, it's just rehashed. It's the same issue I take with Black Ops 4's multiplayer, and to a lesser extent BO3's as well. The choice of specialist, besides the main weapon or ability you get, doesn't really matter in how you play a match or against other certain characters. In Infinite Warfare, they try to do this thing with their specialist that includes some kind of bonus trait or perk that you can select, you know, one of three to differentiate your playstyle, even if hypothetically you're running the same character. Problem is, they're very minor changes to your own character, and the opponent doesn't or can't know which trait you picked, and it fundamentally doesn't change the core gameplay of people running around and shooting each other at all. The only real thing that has a tangible effect on your gameplay, like I said, is the specialist weapon or ability itself. Everything additional they tried to add on top of that is just kind of pointless. The viable weapon selection boils down to really just a few couple of weapons in the game, and for some reason, Infinity Ward's last two games, including this, have had a problem with an LMG-dominated meta. And trust me, there's plenty of variants for it too. And that goes for nearly everything in the game. It's artificial depth is what I call it. There's admittedly a ton of neat perk and equipment and specialist interactions theoretically, and on paper this game should have some real tangible depth based on reading how the game works from an outside perspective on paper. But my experience both when the game launched in 2016 and even now in 2022 is that nothing of the sort really changed the core gameplay all that much. People basically play multiplayer the exact same way every time, regardless of character, ability, or traits. They will go to the same spots, move the same way, and shoot people the same way regardless as well. And it's amplified further by the fact that this game has weapon variants, and for those unfamiliar because we haven't seen them in COD in a while, these were were different versions of a base weapon that you could acquire via supply drops with stat changing effects. Now, the system in this game wasn't nearly as egregious as Advanced Warfare. In that game, you could acquire guns with just literally more damage and a faster time to kill than the base version from drops. Infinite Warfare's variants are a bit more subtle. Maybe you spawn in with an extra magazine or something, or 
maybe hitting an enemy marks them on the minimap for your team or whatever. It's also not obvious what your enemy's variants even do when you get killed by them in game, unless you somehow have that gun or can remember what it does because you looked at the symbol in the menu beforehand and you recognize it. They wanted to make variants not too game altering like AW, and that's fair enough, but I think the implementation and acquisition of variants is still very sloppy. Technically, you can craft variants with salvage and in-game currency, but don't even get me started on that concept. This game had the most grindy and unrewarding currency collection I've seen possibly in video games ever. The amount of variants that exist and how many the average player will get without spending money is a joke. People dog on Call of Duty now, myself included, for being money grubbing with their store bundles being insanely overpriced, but this system was essentially just as bad if not worse. At least in modern COD you can outright buy what you want, and that wasn't a guarantee in this game. Both systems suck, but it's a good example of how times have changed in the gaming landscape. Infinite Warfare, for some reason, felt the need to make everything have variants, including score streaks. Now, I've not even talked about the base score streaks yet, because honestly, there isn't much to say. They feel like watered-down, rehashed versions of Black Ops 3 score streaks, and if you're familiar with those, then you've already played with these ones. But by that point, they were just kind of tired and played out in this game. To be fair, there is a nuke kill streak as well, but only if you have the nuke variant on your gun. But even that seems kind of rehashed in this game. But getting back to score streak variants, so let me give you an example. The UAV has a few different versions. One of them lasts longer but is more resilient to damage. One of them has a shorter lifespan but is resistant to rockets and so on. Just different attributes that make the streak behave somewhat differently, right? So what's the big problem? They're not all the same attributes attributes, but each streak has variants like this. And again, the only way to know what kind of streak it is, and potentially what its weaknesses are and how to beat it, you can only know if you somehow remember the name of that variant or you have it yourself. It's not clear to a new player what a UAV pack rat means. It's a cool idea, I guess, but again, a very sloppy implementation. It really feels like weapon variants and score streak variants only exist to inflate the perceived amount of real content, and of course to push supply drop purchases. It's kind of sinister when I think about it that way, but besides that, uh, the maps are also kind of bland. I'll admit there are a few exceptions, but for the most part they are the most generic and forgettable COD maps perhaps Infinity Ward has ever produced. The maps also don't allow for any real creativity within the movement. It's still very cookie cutter the way you have to traverse the map, despite them making the illusion of depth. The maps struggle a little bit with the systems the game wants to have. There's like one or two memorable original maps from this game. I do actually like the throwback map, and I, I, I kind of like, um, I, I don't know, this one. And even then, most of their maps are like generic, futuristic, ultra clean, almost AI generated locations with no real personality. The remakes they did have don't play all that well either. Warhawk from Ghost Returns, but slap advanced movement into that map and it's as unbalanced and incredibly awkward as you can imagine. Rust from MW2 is reworked to accommodate the movement system, but feels very foreign and just doesn't gel well with the movement at all. Resistance from MW3 came back, but this is practically a one-to-one -one remake and it just feels so strange with IW's movement, and above all else, the gunplay just feels so unsatisfying in this game. There's this indescribable feeling when getting a kill in COD multiplayer that feels some type of way, and you may not be able to explain it, but you all know what I'm talking about. Some COD games Games just feel more satisfying per kill than other games. And this is just a theory, but I honestly think it has a lot to do with how the kill pop-ups look and sound. Hear me out. MW2, every kill you get, you get this meaty sound and a giant yellow pop-up. It's like very apparent and even over the top at times. Infinite Warfare's pop-ups are like so minimal and clean. I get it fits with the aesthetic of the game, but it's so small and faint sometimes, I don't even see if I got the kill until a second or two later. I'm speculating of course, but something about this game's gunplay just wasn't really doing it for me. The time to kill is so unbelievably fast, you don't even have time to have real gunfights in this game a whole lot. It's a matter of who sees each other first, generally speaking as well. 
all of these intended systems for MP probably would work a bit better if the health was just a tad higher and gunfights went on a little bit longer. And the gunplay wasn't quite so twitchy, I think it could actually work okay. I'm not saying that's a bad thing in its current implementation exactly, but it does make those systems kind of irrelevant. All that being said, there are some things I really like about Infinite Warfare's multiplayer. I really do like the movement, and I've gone on record multiple times, I'm a big fan of jetpack movement in COD, I'm just going to say it. But again, it's this version is rehashed from Black Ops 3. I really think the color palette in this game is also excellent. It's got just enough color to keep the game visually interesting, without going too far in a few places and becoming cartoony or silly. I also like how the leaderboards work, and I, I mean just literally the in-game ones. I can see both my kills and deaths. Hell, in the lobby, you can just see everyone's KD, win-loss ratio, and other stats flat out without clicking in. I have to say, that's something that drives me insane about modern Call of Duty games. I can't see my deaths and other important stats. And you can debate about why they removed that stat tracker, but it's just kind of impractical if you ask me. I like how Infinite Warfare also has both pre-packaged emblems that you can get and also an emblem editor. I would be very happy to see the system return in a future COD project. I really like how the equipment, streaks, and specialist systems are supposed to interact and play out, and it's cool when they do admittedly, it's just a very rare occurrence for that to ever happen. In the case of good multiplayers, they really feel like they're at least trying to do their own thing. I just don't really get that sense with this one, and the player count during the life cycle of this game certainly reflected that as well. But all things considered, I don't have too much else to say about this game's MP. It's like they took the gunplay of Ghost fundamentally and stole Black Ops 3's movement and called it a day. It doesn't feel like it has much personality or identity on its own. Even the announcers are really generic and boring. Team Deathmatch. Team Deathmatch! Call of Duty, colon, Infinite Wars, man. It's probably the most forgettable COD aspect of Infinite Warfare, and like I said, I don't exactly hate it, but it's not one of the more notable Call of Duty multiplayers by a long shot. But that's okay, because if the campaign for some reason wasn't doing it for you, and if the multiplayer wasn't doing it for you, this still had one more giant mode uh, and content to offer, and that of course being zombies. Infinite Warfare Zombies was truly something else. At the time of its release, if you could detach the mode from the rest of the game, I remember this getting a moderately positive response, and myself, I did quite like it on launch. Admittedly, I still ended up playing more Black Ops 3 Zombies, but it just had the unfortunate task to follow directly after the super serious and beloved BO3 Zombies. However, in some ways, I think IW Zombies is still fairly comparable to BO3 in more ways than one, and I mean that in both good and bad ways. So before we can get down to brass tacks, this is another pillar of the game where you can tell the producers were all massive fans of film, and this pro project was primarily directed by Lee Ross. Lee Ross and the team even went so far as to get a film celebrity for each of their maps. David Hasselhoff for Spaceland, Kevin Smith for Raven the Redwoods, Pam Greer for Shallon Shuffle, and Elvira for Attack of the Radioactive Thing. Hell, they even got your boy Pee Wee Herman to play Willard Weiler, the game's man antagonist. This was a direct injection of identity and personality right away into each map, if nothing else. You directly associate that celebrity with their map. Even the entire premise of this zombie storyline was about these four characters being transported into a film in real life and having to escape that film only to be transported to a new one with Willard Weiler pulling the strings the whole time. There's a plethora of film references throughout the entirety of this game, and it's incredibly inspired in that sense. Not only that, but there's also just great music that plays in certain areas of the map that's just too hard to not find charming. A few criticisms I've seen thrown the way of Cold War Zombies, and even Vanguard if you can consider that, is that a lot of the maps themselves feel bland or samey. Even if the gameplay systems are good, and sometimes they're not, I can see where that's coming from. You know, you, like, you have bad guy military base number one, or bad guy military base number two. With IW, you go from an 80s theme park, to a 90s slasher movie swamp, to a downtown city and dojo, to a 50s monster movie, to uh, whatever this is. 
。哦、oh. uh,。You know,、uh, but my point is, in a vacuum, each map is distinct for very clear reasons. They all have a different tone and feel to them. Before we get to the maps in great detail, let's look at some of the systems the game has to offer. Firstly, IW basically did the elixir system first with fate and fortune cards. Well, again, on paper, I have no problem with this. I've already went into painful, extreme detail about why gums and BO3 are the superior system. Again, not that F and F cards are bad; they're just a worse version of the previous one. And if you want a more detailed explanation as to why, I'd recommend watching my Black Ops 4 video. Anyways, the F and F cards certainly added a little something to this experience. While not as nearly as interesting as Gobblegums, they're a very welcome change. Also, IW would see the addition of weapon variants into zombies for the first time ever. Now, here's where I make a distinction about these. I'm I'm more okay with variants of guns in zombies because number one, you're not having to actively play against them like in a PvP situation, and they're also such minor benefits that they hardly even matter in zombies at all. In fact, there's some that literally don't even work in zombies, and I I, I kind of like that. It's not like having a good variant of a gun automatically makes Makes you a good player, or will carry you compared to somebody who doesn't have that particular variant. In fact, I kind of forgot zombies' weapon variants existed until revisiting this game. Fundamentally, what I like about IW Systems is that even in the face of F and F cards and weapon variants, the game still has a very high emphasis on player skill and decision making, which I'll explain further soon. But both movement and reactions are still fundamentally integral to the core gameplay, which I give it tons of points for. But IW also broke new ground by giving us the first real big super Easter egg reward, in which after completing every map's main Easter egg, you can now play in something that's known as Director's Cut, which spawns you in on round one with every perk in the game and 25,000 points to go wild with. This absolutely does break the game, yes, but considering you have to do the work of each main quest and boss fight normally to get there, you've kind of earned it, if you ask me. There's also some neat secret inputs you can do at the select screen of a map to play as the celebrity character, and this gives you a totally different set of character quotes and melee animations and so on. Now, playing as a celebrity isn't always ideal. See a magic wheel? Putting out does make people happy. Yo, chill. What'd you just say? Chill out, girl. See a magic wheel? Putting out does make people happy. Are you just gonna? Are you gonna say that again? What's going on? Are you good? See magic wheel? Oh my、Putting、god. Can you stop, please? Stop. I'm trying to. Just relax, okay? It's, it's not that serious. Alright, can you, can you, can you please、happy. cut it out? I'm trying to review your map. Call of Duty colon Infinite Wars, man. But again, totally optional and add something special to each map. But with the general systems covered, let's get into maps a little bit. Now I have to say it right off the bat: Spaceland is the best map in Infinite Warfare Zombies, as far as design, layout, and overall content offered, and how tightly crafted it all is. Spaceland was peak in terms of having a layout that made sense. It follows the classic Duris formula with the central hub with pack a punch and you know a few areas to its left and right, and they're a bit more expanded than the original formula intended. But the map is still very easy to traverse. The portals. Are perfectly placed, and you can get from one place to another in no time if you know where to go. And there's some super unique traps and parts of the map to interact with. Each area is distinctly themed and labeled, so that communication is pretty straightforward. And each area has an identity, so you know where to go. There's machines around the maps that you can add coins to and make special gear and traps. This was a neat system, sort of like the Zetsubo plants and the different colors of water, but way more intuitive and rewarding. Spaceland also has everything I love in a main Easter egg. It managed to be difficult without being tedious. The challenge is always within the actual gameplay, and it's expertly done. Even crafting the wonder weapons, these 80s space laser pistols, is fun without being annoying to do. The boss fight of the map is spectacular as well. You battle a blue alien from a UFO that descends into the park, and you need to remove two fuses from its back. It's way easier said than done, as the alien himself and the zombies are extremely punishing of mistakes. 
In fact, some of you may remember this boss fight had to be nerfed and toned down in difficulty within the first two weeks of the game because it was way too brutal and challenging for most people. Even after the nerf, however, the boss fight is still a fair challenge even to this day, and again, it's hard without really being unfair. If you die, you know exactly where you messed up and what you did wrong, and you generally blame yourself and not the game, which is always a great sign to me. And if you're not actively doing the main quest, it's still a great map just to jump in and shoot zombies on, or do side easter eggs like Ghost and Skulls, which in all honesty is kind of a main easter egg on its own. This was also one of the first times in Zombies where they played with an alternate form of currency, this time in the form of theme park tickets. You can get these tickets from regular gameplay, you know, playing games in the arcade and so on, but the tickets can be redeemed for prizes and weapons behind the desk at the arcade. It's actually part of getting and upgrading the wonder weapons as well. And for some reason, IW would drop this concept of alternate currency as the DLC season went on for unknown reasons. There's just enough in the map to really feel like it's being its own thing. This is certainly a case of Lee Ross and Infinity Ward having a vision and being able to execute it to the best possible degree. As an on-disc map, you can tell where this is the most amount of care, attention to detail, and otherwise love for the mode went into, which for a lot of Zombies titles, and especially this is true for non-Treyarch, they always peak with their on-disc map, but honestly, for being a non-Treyarch experience, Spaceland did an excellent job, and I have very few critiques at all of this map. It's beloved still by most of the community now, where Spaceland is generally their favorite IW map, so I'm, I'm not even going to get into my criticisms a whole lot because they're, they are very minor. Unfortunately, however, in terms of that super tight design, attention to detail, and just great gameplay, that doesn't last forever, sadly, and the maps would begin to drop in quality a little bit as the season progressed, which brings us to DLC 1, Rave in the Redwoods. Rave was DLC 1 of this Zombies experience, and I always feel a game really needs to nail it with DLC 1 to keep people on board for the rest of the year, and it kind of sets the tone going forward, and to IW's disdain, I don't think they really nailed it with this one. Uh, this map is set in a 90s slasher movie camp and swamp. A very recognizable and unique locale, and it tried a lot of what Spaceland did so well, but I think just fumbled the execution. Let me get the bad out of the way with this map before I do discuss what's good with it. The layout does not have a central hub this time with Pack-a-Punch. In this one, you have to build a boat to get to Kevin Smith on an island, and in the most exciting sequence since the dragons in Garad Krovi, you make your way over there. Call of Duty, colon, Infinite Wars, man. The map to me has a bit more of a sloppy layout than Spaceland, and there's a pretty substantial amount of wasted space. The areas don't really feel as distinct as Spaceland's did either, and if you're a new player, you might find yourself getting lost a lot or backtracking quite a bit because of its clunky layout. The Wonder Weapons are also another iteration of that, you know, classic four elemental Wonder Weapon formula that by this point we've gotten very used to, this time in the form of a crossbow. To be fair, these are all pretty interesting and unique, and the way you upgrade them is actually a lot of fun, but there is a by far superior one, and also for some reason, you know how in classic zombies dog rounds, it would say fetch me their souls, cause you know, they're, they're dogs? Well, they literally say fetch me their souls in, in these maps too. Fetch me their souls. Even though they're not dogs, and it makes no sense given that context, just kind of found that funny. As far as the main easter egg goes, it involves you collecting and cleansing photos of Kevin and Jay as he gives you exposition about their friendship. Technically speaking, this entire easter egg can be done on round one if you really wanted to. It's the same simple premise as Spaceland as far as the steps go, but it lacks the real challenge I felt like Spaceland did so well. This one just didn't feel quite as tightly crafted as the previous map. The boss fight is also far less interesting in my opinion. In a revelation that even Ray Charles could see coming, 
coming, you find out that Kevin Smith is indeed the super slasher, and he morphs into the massive boy that you fight throughout this uh, entire boss fight. I'm okay with this as a concept, and it's the gameplay of the boss fight that I feel is kind of dull. You need to fill up two soul boxes to create a cleansing circle and escape rave mode and then deal real damage to the slasher. My issue is the actual boss isn't that much of a threat like the alien was in Spaceland. Also, it's more time-gated than skill-gated compared to other fights. Even if you're ultra-efficient, realistically, you're probably not going to finish this fight in under 10 minutes uh, because there's just basically some sequences you have to wait for, and they can get a little bit repetitive and certainly drag on a little bit, but it's not a terrible fight, but it's very middle of the road or average to me. But those are my only real issues with Rave. I really do like the atmosphere of the map. It's got a lot of character, and Rave mode as a concept is super interesting, and I think they made great use out of it with this map. Uh, the fact that the slasher only appears in rave mode and in most circumstances can only you can only get killed by him when you're in that is hilarious to me. There's some great secret hidden messages in this map, and they're kind of hard to get some of them, but you can find a pacifier, for example, that tells the story of Willard Wyler's daughter being killed by the slasher, and you get to figure out, like, why Willard Wyler is as evil as he is. It's just a neat story that helps illustrate the map in the greater context a little bit better, but like I said, while it's not nearly as expertly made as Spaceland, it still feels like it had its own ideas, and even to this day, it's not a terrible map to play, but with that being said, that will bring us to DLC 2, Shaolin Shuffle. <sighs> this map. Alright, Shaolin Shuffle I have very mixed feelings about. On the one hand, I can appreciate the hard shift in direction as far as easter eggs go with this one, but also this map is where you can clearly tell they were just slapping parts of it together, and I'm not exactly sure if the annoying parts of this map are meant to be self-aware or not, but in any case though, it's got its charm and some things I think are great, but it's definitely got its pain points too. So let's start with what I do like. Firstly, the setting and atmosphere are phenomenal. Being downtown and able to traverse throughout the subway, nightclub, dojo, and so on, this map has a very apparent feel to it, which is nice. And there are some elements of the main easter egg I enjoy, but other parts of it I hate, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, the boss fight itself has its problems as well, but it at least is decent fun to play over and over again. I like how during the main easter egg, Pam Greer just kind of chills in her area and gives you hints about maybe what you should do next, but they're super vague, so you probably don't know what to do, so you still gotta go and find it, which is, which is fun enough, but you have this guiding force which is nice. I like how there's a step in the main easter egg where the film crashes during a certain step randomly and you get transported somewhere else. That's that's kind of fun. The layout is a bit better than Rave, admittedly for sure, but not nearly as good as Spaceland, and that's really about it for what I like in terms of major things. My main issues with this map are the somewhat tedious easter egg steps, namely the Rat King symbols that only spawn one at a time with like 13 different locations around the map. Too much guesswork and running around for my liking, to be, to be honest. Also, doing Morse code in zombies is never something I condone anymore. It was cool the first time around, but at this point, I'm kind of just sick of it, honestly. This map also doesn't have the four Wonder Weapon formula exactly. There are these cheese that you can drink to get Kung Fu powers, and there are four different versions of them, and they're fun enough, but honestly aren't that useful at all compared to actual weapons, so they're a bit of a waste and you don't really use them a whole lot. I've not even talked about these special enemies in any of these maps yet, because they're not really noteworthy or anything or felt like worth talking about, but in Shaolin Shuffle, these have to be one of the worst special enemies they've ever made. These teleporting kung fu zombies make it almost impossible to evade via normal movement methods. Sprinting will practically make them lock onto you, and they deal the same damage as a normal zombie. I cannot stress enough how awful these are. They make high rounds and first rooms incredibly annoying and unfun. Without them, or just with some slight reworks, they'd be much more tolerable. And the boss fight is, uh, well, it's fine, I suppose. You do three different challenges while evading the Rat King, and then you take him out at the end. The challenges are kind of interesting, but not very well done or refined, if you ask me. It's a great idea on paper, but it's a very average or below average boss fight to me in execution. And it might sound like I'm being pretty hard on Shaolin, but those are my only real grievances with it. Other than that, the map does have a lot of other, you know, minor likable qualities. And it's very palatable still, and it's a decent survival survival map, just not nearly as well masterfully done as the maps that came before it. And this will bring us to DLC 3, Attack of the Radioactive Thing. 
All right, can I be real about this for a second? I hate this map, and there's not a whole lot of zombies maps that I actively dislike. I can usually find enough redeeming qualities about a map to somewhat like it or at least be neutral on it, but with attack, I think this map is genuinely awful with one redeeming quality. It's practically everything I hate in a zombies map all rolled into one. Too large with tons of wasted space. Seriously, there's like three or four key areas and everything else is just filler. 400 million random parts and pieces to gather, and an unbelievably tedious main easter egg. Just watch this part of the tutorial for the main easter egg I made a few years ago, and see if this sounds fun to you. The pi number is basically this one over here on the right. I know it's not actually pi, but this is just so I can simplify it. For number that was not crossed out, whatever that might be, filters, as you guys so can see, going from red, green, and blue, all the other first two symbols are crossed out, and this is basically two so numbers, so numbers and I'm going to that by using the that you can that chemical this map exemplifies basically everything I hate in zombies. Again, except for one thing, which we'll get to. The basic idea of this map is that you're in a 50s monster movie, and I can't tell if the game looks terrible in this map because they want to fit the aesthetic and, and theme they're going for, or because they just didn't have the budget to make this map look nice. In any case, it looks like a PS2 game that was made in 2017. It's like baffling, but essentially you're creating a bomb with the help of Elvira, the celebrity in this map, which which is the only way to destroy the monster called Krogzilla. It's a fine premise and I understand what they were going for with the tone and you know silly elements of this map but the gameplay itself is just so intolerable I can hardly stand it. Even the wonder weapon is mildly interesting at best and downright boring at worst. It's not really a fun or exciting survival map because it's so open and free and it's not really a fun quest map either because you need a PhD in chemistry to do the easter egg. I'm exaggerating of course, and there are cheat sheets now that make this process a whole lot smoother, but my problem is that's all it becomes, brainlessly plugging in variables to get some number you don't care about just to get to the end. And to be fair, the boss fight itself is somehow one of my favorite. If this map didn't have a great boss fight, it would easily be an F tier map to me. But this fight is so unique and well executed, it prevents me from quite throwing out the map altogether. First sequence, you escort a bomb to the beach while being bombarded with meteors, and it's like genuinely kind of tough because it doesn't let up even for a second. Second sequence is you shoot them with lasers that are posted all around the beach, and it's kind of fun, you know, it's, it's a fine step. Third sequence is you hold out and you wait for these lasers to spawn in, and you have to move masterfully through jumping and sliding to get to the bottom of the beach. And then final step, you plug in these numbers that it gives you at the beginning of the game to activate the bomb. But it's pretty challenging because this scrolls by pretty Pretty fast. Easy idea, but the fight is always a genuine challenge, and it's so unique and fun to do. I'm actually shocked a map this bad has such a good boss fight. Thank god for the boss rush mode, because I could go the rest of my life without doing this main easter egg ever again, but I would like to play the boss fight whenever I, you know, whenever I feel like it. I'm not really sure what the thought process was when making this map, but like 98% of the ideas just fell flat to me in all honesty, but the boss fight itself is arguably worth playing it at least once just for that reason. But all things considered for Attack of the Radioactive Thing, another real step down in quality, but that brings us to our final map in the season, DLC 4 Beast From Beyond. So the final map in the season, the Beast From Beyond, is where this game really started to crumble, but as far as I'm concerned, this whole map was a red herring for what they were truly working on, and don't worry, we'll get there. But this map didn't even really need to exist, it was simply a vehicle to tell the rest of the story. But this map is takes place on like a lunar facility or something with cryptids. Yes, the ones from Extinction uh, appear on this map. The implementation of cryptids were genuinely terrible here, and in Extinction because they're obviously fast moving enemies you had a health bar that was you know fit for that game and they had a certain attack power that adjusted accordingly meaning you take less damage generally speaking from fast moving enemies because it makes sense it would be unfair if a cryptid dealt the same damage as a slow stumbling zombie right 
Well, in Beast from Beyond, the Cryptids have their super fast movement speed, exactly from Extinction, but they deal the same damage as a slow moving zombie. And no, this doesn't make the game harder, it makes it broken. You, can, you can't take an enemy and its mechanics from a totally different game and slap it into new systems without making any tweaks and call it a day. It just doesn't work like that and it's not good gameplay at all. The map's layout is kind of like Revelations where it's like pieces from other maps previously in the, in the series kind of strung into one, but it's also incredibly clunky and awkward. The main easter egg is getting the Neil robot and getting some punch cards uh, on something so he can do a thing where... You know what, I, I don't even care to explain this one. The entire map is a red herring and a stage for what the real point was. Even this map's boss fight is horrendous and the worst boss fight in all of COD Zombies in my opinion. In a fight where you're in a tight area in like a warehouse, fighting only cryptids and a massive amounts of them at once. Again, the fight isn't hard, but the implementation of these enemies makes each run feel like a coin toss. I think it could have worked much better if they spent a little more time balancing how the cryptids move and deal damage than not at all. We often joke, you know, that maps will copy and paste systems from one another, you know, kind of like the one, the four wonder weapon format and so on. But in this case, it is literally a copy paste from extinction with no additional thought to balancing factors or anything but assuming you manage to play this godforsaken map and you get past the worst boss fight in cod zombies history you're then greeted with the best boss fight in cod zombies ironically enough mephistopheles is where all the love and passion went into in a final showdown against lee ross or the devil himself this is the most skill check boss fight the entire series has to offer it's a long fight too but but like not in a way that drags on, but in a way that tests your attention, reaction, and endurance. One or two mistakes will mean game over and a reset, and the fight just makes you want to run it back every time you, you know, you lose or you fail. The fight has devastating but highly reactable moves from the boss, and pretty much every enemy within the game that's appeared so far takes part in it as well. You have to stand in these ritual circles for like a certain amount of time to release and fill up souls, shoot them at Mephistopheles to knock him down, and then take a ritual circle off his body, all while continuing to read his attacks and react to them. This is the prime example of a true boss fight in my eyes, and a near perfect implementation into zombies that I sincerely hope we have more of in the future. I find it ironic how the literal worst boss fight in COD Zombies preceded the actual best back to back, like one right after another but this fight alone above and beyond no pun intended makes this dlc actually worth it and i cannot say enough good things about mephistopheles and i think zombies should use this fight as a blueprint going forward and it was certainly worthy of being a final act for this game while the map attached to it is questionable at best there's no denying the sheer sauce and mastery the mephistopheles fight brings to the table So, with all of that said, was Call of Duty Infinite Warfare secretly a masterpiece that was just surrounded by unfortunate circumstances? Well, I'll let you draw your own conclusions on that, but to me, not exactly. If you had only played the campaign and a bit of multiplayer and some Spaceland, you might actually feel that way. But if you played a bit on more and more of multiplayer and zombies throughout as the year went on, the game was beginning to fall apart to some degree, so no. I don't think it's a masterpiece by any means, but I do think it's a very solid Call of Duty game depending on what you like playing for. Campaign is excellent in my estimation, uh, while multiplayer is a little bit weaker, it still has its enjoyable qualities and zombies Zombies, the map on disc and the final act are both outstanding, but everything in the middle separating them is kind of all over the place. It's an interesting game to say the least, and while I don't think it's the best Call of Duty of all time, it certainly did not reflect that insane dislike bar that's fundamentally attached to its identity now. The game is not the greatest ever made, but it's still deserving of a spot at the table of unique and interesting COD games.